The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's webcast. Today, our chat is going to be taking place on our Threat Hunter Community Discord server. If you haven't joined us for a webcast before, we use our Discord server for chat and QA during all of our webcasts. Um, there's also a ton of other channels around the concept of threat hunting. We also have LinkedIn connections and career hunting channels as well. So it's just a great place to interact with the community. And Burnham, I hope this answers your question. Uh, yes, we are doing pre-show today. If you Again, if you haven't joined us for a webcast before, uh, welcome and thank you for being here. We like to do a 30-minute pre-show before all of our webcasts. It's just a great time for us to get to know the community better and for you to get to know us beyond the actual presentation. And I see we have a wild Chris joining us okay. with some very interesting yeah. wall art in the background. Oh, yeah. that's been there for a couple of webcasts now. <laughs> I think I've already been Not there. I, new anymore. I think I'm a chicken. <laughs> you got your chicken? <laughs> Did you do it? <laughs> Yeah, don't look to the center of that thing. <laughs> so it's, what's, oh, yeah. it's, it's what's referred to as kinetic art. It's actually like spring driven. So there's no batteries or electric power or anything like that. And yeah, you'll see it kind of spin and spin and uh, it'll look like it's about to stop. And then all of a sudden, whoosh, it'll just kind of take back off again. And it's going to do that for like three or four hours. So everybody enjoy. I figure that's far more interesting to look at than me. So. <laughs> I just hope it isn't far more interesting than the than the uh, webcast itself. That's the scary part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go, Bill. You can just like film it and put it in a couple of the slides. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Bill. Kinetic art. Kinetic art. Kinetic art. Okay. Thank you, everybody. See you next time. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> the thing no is, no one cool. will notice. No one. You know, and in the picture, you can see like just uh, slices of your ceiling fan. So if it wasn't described, you could almost assume that it's being powered by the, you know, the breeze from the fan or something. Being powered by the ceiling fan? Yeah. <laughs> being powered by hot air. Yes. Yeah. Chris, JD50 saying he loves your hair. It says it kind of looks, it looks kind of like some Robert Plant kind of thing and then he posted a gift oh, nice. <laughs> but you used to have an even bigger mane than that so yeah i did oh, i wouldn't take that as a huge compliment i did had a wicked long and then cut it short and you know pandemic so it started growing back out long again and i think i might kind of keep it this way so yeah good deal well you know chris you're robert plant and i was born on the same day as jimmy page ah yeah. People don't know is the lead guitarist for Led Zeppelin. So yeah, so that that explains why we get mistaken for Led Zeppelin all the time. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, let's start a band. Yeah. Hey, uh, you know, I was thinking of something earlier. I, I didn't bother googling it or anything else, but uh, I'm sure it's been put out there. But um, like working with uh, C2 implants, like mm -hmm. you know, running a like a compromise on a host or setting up a, a stager for a C2. That most of these stagers run purely in memory. Uh, they don't write to disk. So, I mean, a simple reboot of the OS, I mean, destroys the implant. You know, it, it has no persistence. So, I'm wondering why it's not some type of procedure in corporate networks that all endpoints reboot like once every 24 hours. Wouldn't that be easy and free? to basically clean out anything that may be running in memory. Well, it means you've got to have other systems that can take the load for whatever that computer was supposed to be doing while it's gone. It's not unreasonable. Yeah. And if it's an endpoint, you got to make sure you're not trashing people's data every night. Right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But I'm thinking that, you know, a majority of uh, the people working at their workstations, I would think, you know, work whatever, eight to five, nine to five, uh, I'm sure there are some workstations where the next shift takes over, but I would think there'd be plenty of idle time in there, I would think, anyways. But at least that, also, that assumes that, that it hasn't 
set up some type of way to persist across yeah. reboots. In some cases, that may be the, true, but in some cases, it's, they will have something put in that will force that implant to restart after the reboot, maybe back in RAM, just like normal. I can't speak to exactly how that would be done, but... Well, very so true. Paperclip's got it right. Reboot all the things. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm just thinking, I mean, at least you get rid of the low-hanging fruit. On the, well, I, I also think that that's usually initial stage to go in, stay resident in memory, to try and uh, hide away from whatever endpoint detection software might be there. If it was me, the next thing I would do is evaluate what endpoint protection software is there. Can I disable it? And if I can, then I would go in and establish persistency. So it might just be a transitory state that it's only in memory. Yeah, I know a lot of the, um, a lot of the Cobalt Strike stuff I run, it's, it's purely in memory. Uh, you know, unless you run, unless you write your own profiles, um, it, it's running in memory, so it can't survive reboots. Now, of course, that's just, you know, stock out of the box stuff. And I know a lot of this, you know, a lot of the, I guess, more evil stuff is more advanced, but it was just something that just crossed my mind. I was just kind of curious about, because I know myself on my, my own workstation, when I'm done working, I just shut it off. Um, I don't leave it running all night long unless, I have processes that need to run all night long, but I almost always turn everything off when I'm done. And on the other end of the scale is the guy who just cannot deal with shutting his laptop down because there are literally 700 plus Chrome tabs that I've gotten very good at saving <laughs> time to time. Uh, I think I'm about 20 virtual desktops and more, you know, another 40 shell terminals that are running tasks constantly in the background. Yeah, so, um, I'm also reminded of a webcast John did a couple of weeks ago on endpoint security, where uh, he had shut his primary and his backup laptop off, and he was supposed to be doing a presentation while he was down in Costa Rica. And when he turned the laptops on, they came up and said, oh, hey, it's time for you to patch. And uh, yeah, so it literally came down to like, <laughs> Erica was texting Jason with, it says it's 19% complete. It says it's 82% complete to try and figure out, is John going to be able to get on the webcast in time? Uh, and yeah, it took about an hour. And I think he was like one minute late. Oh man! One minute late and didn't have Discord loaded yet. So, yeah. so yeah. The other issue you can kind of run into is that you may have something to do when Windows might have different ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. I'd much rather have a Linux system that will let me decide when I'm going to update it <laughs> than, than tell me that you are going to update it. Well, Bill, Bill prefers Linux. When did this happen? <laughs> and ironically, I'm running on Mac OS, of course, so I totally screwed myself there. I have a cloud system that desperately, and I do mean desperately, needs to be rebooted. Its, it's uh, clock has drifted off of something, and it's it basically nothing with, to do with time works anymore. It's been up for 1,352 days, which is... Oh, a little yeah. under four years. That's a, that's a lot of years, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yep. Exactly. Oh, actually, that speaks uh, good volumes for your uh, electric power company in your area. Or, <laughs> it's, or it's your, a cloud server. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, it's a cloud server, so I can't even take credit for that one. <laughs> oh, I didn't catch that. So. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know in Florida, you got to have some really strong EPS systems, or you would never have that kind of uptime. Yeah. yeah. And Probably. actually, I think I, I replace at least half of my UPSs every year down here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Has anybody ever tried replacing the batteries on a UPS? Is there any financial advantage to just mailing a dead battery back? Getting it? No. Nope. I did it once. Ones. And the batteries, I think, were $52 each, and it needed two of them. And I think I paid $110 for the UPS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so I, and then $9 in shipping to get the dead ones yes. back. Yeah, okay. So it'll yeah. save you $4 worth of plastic. Avesco has a, a scary comment. He was talking about uh, someone had a 24-hour exam, 
that they flunked because Windows had to patch just as he was supposed to start showing evidence. Oh, yeah. oh so. no. Oh, oh no. yeah. My dog ate it. Windows had to patch. I mean, they're kind of neck and neck now. Right? <laughs> I, yeah. I have a hard and fast rule that I don't patch my system for the week leading up to a conference. Because <laughs> I don't, as much as I would like to, I, I just can't risk having to fight, you know, background applications that aren't working or, or a configuration file that's been changed or something else that's been modified. So, so one of the things I found kind of humorous was, um, you know, the, the Google challenge they do every year where, hey, can you find problems in the browsers? There's a decent amount of money that's usually at stake at that. Apparently, what some of the teams do is they will find multiple zero days, and they will figure out which one do they want to use for their attack. And about two weeks before that conference, they report all of the other zero days they found in the hopes that the teams that they were going to go up against were using one of those exploits. They would now get patched right before the event, and then they wouldn't be able to challenge them. <laughs> oh man! Wow! Mm. <laughs> wow! That's harsh. It is. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> harsh. <laughs> and Bill, I see a comment in here saying uh, "NT update won't fix your your system where the time has drifted badly." Oh, this is a Linux system. It's running. Oh boy! Version negative five. Uh, you're 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 about right. Uh, Fedora eleven. You would have a hard time finding Fedora eleven <laughs> to pull down at all. Uh, the patches ran out a long time ago. <laughs> oh my! Oh, so if there's no new patches, it must team. be a secure system, right? If they stop no. releasing patches, that's because they got it right, and there's no more securities. Uh, no. Oh, that's what that <laughs> means. Okay. Yeah, that's what that means. Oh, I'm safe. Nobody, yeah. Yeah. So, like, you know, Windows 95, run that. There's no more patches. They've got it finally locked down. The advice you get out of this group before the webcast starts is basically the equivalent of a, an attachment from a person you've never heard of. Yes. yes. Just assume everything yeah. is sarcasm. Yeah. Please. Yeah, right. Please. Yeah. Oh, and hey, Shelby, I've actually got my active countermeasure shirt. Woo -woo. Nice. Nice. Hey, what does it say on there? I didn't catch it. Target. Oh, it says active countermeasures. It says target oh. acquired. <laughs> yeah, target acquired. <laughs> yes, target acquired. Oh, okay. AC Hunter looking for C2. Yep. Um, you can find that t-shirt along with our Got Beacons shirt on the Spearfish General Store. Thank you for taking part today. My name is Bill Stearns. I work with Active Countermeasures, and I'm here to cause trouble and uh, spread misinformation. Today, hey, one last thing, Bill. Your camera is actually still on, just so you know. All right. So don't get naked or anything. The camera's still running. There I would go. never, never do that on a presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> we have had a couple of people who've taken part in our different presentations who taken part in Discord, who have written in technical questions for uh, AC Hunter, our commercial product, or Rita. And the, the focus of those questions is, look, you're nice to tell me that there's something going on on my network. What am I supposed to do about it? And while I can't give you a week-long forensics class, the goal today is to go over what are the basic steps that you can take to investigate this, to document this. So let's take a look at what, what we're going to, to talk about. If you haven't joined Discord already, that link is going to be down in the chat window for GoToWebinar. And uh, Shelby, if you could just post that one more time, I'd appreciate it. Please go ahead and join in because we do have, obviously, live chat for today's talk. Keith and Chris and Shelby and Chris have been nice enough to join in and answer questions. So please, if you've got things that aren't making sense, put them in there and we'll try to answer them before the presentation is over. Down in live webcast chat is where that's going to be happening. If you haven't gotten the slides yet, those are down in ACM-webcast content. 
And we also encourage you to join back later because in threat hunting process, we would think this would be a great place to talk about what do I do next? How do I handle this incident? Just like anything else in Discord, don't post anything that is truly private. You probably want to leave company names and uh, individual IP addresses out, try to sanitize what you upload, but it's a great place to ask general questions. So we've got something that's shown up as potentially malicious. What are we going to do about it? Well, you could get a source of this information from your threat hunting process. You might find an IP address that's doing something it shouldn't. You might find an error in your log review where you've got some traffic that looks malicious. You have an event that doesn't make sense. You have a system doing things that it shouldn't be doing. You have connections happening that shouldn't be taking place. You have a server that's exhibiting odd behavior. The disk is full. It has tens of thousands of processes when it shouldn't. It's running applications that it shouldn't. Somebody's logged into a virtual desktop and doing things when nobody should be. You might have a network monitoring system that's put up an alert saying this computer is doing things it shouldn't be doing. So your job is to figure out what's going on. Is this something that's malicious? Is it unknown? Is it benign? We're going to go through the process today and we'll see, hopefully by the end, what type of traffic this is and what to do about it when you've made that choice. So this is the overview of the day, the things that we're going to cover. And I'll go and leave this, but simply go on to those actual entries and we'll go through them. First thing I'd like to encourage you to do, when you've got something that looks suspicious, start up a shared document. Use whatever service is appropriate for your organization. I've had good luck with Google Docs, Microsoft Office 365, is it? There has its own shared document system. Something where you and other people can be editing it at the same time is really helpful. You don't want to be investigating a major incident and have be passing control of a document back and forth between people or emailing it worse. But try to have some place where you can share that information. If you take this approach, make sure you plan ahead for what happens if our internet connection is down or we've deliberately cut our own internet connection. Could we do shared editing over, say, a, a MiFi or something like that? In your doc, start up top with where you want the final report to go. This is going to be a relatively short section, probably two pages or less, maybe three or four if it's a very complex incident. In there, organize what you found in some way that makes sense for this incident. Is it a timeline? Do you organize by the systems? Do you organize by uh, severity? Whatever works for you. In a section below that, write down what you're doing and who's doing it. Who is actually investigating the individual systems? Who's looking at the network traffic? Maybe put people's initials in front of the individual tasks that need to be performed. Do you have someone who's going to be able to do public communications and is authorized to do that? Do you have somebody who's managing the process? Do you have somebody that's analyzing malware? Try to go and break that up so that multiple people can be working on it at the same time. I tend to put raw data at the bottom of that doc, but I could see somebody saying, hey, it makes more sense to us to have that in a totally separate doc and then just use cut and paste. That's cool with me. I would put this as shared among everybody who's going to be doing the investigation and then give read only or comment only access to anybody else so that you don't have to worry about people uh, accidentally deleting stuff because their cat walked across the keyboard at the wrong moment. That never happens, by the way. I would also share this with the system owner, if you know who that is, or system owners. There's a small chance, of course, that the system owner is involved in the incident, so at least try to get a good sense of whether that's the case before you share that with them directly. The details are going to come from multiple sources. And this is where you're going to go back to where you got the initial alert. 
Remember I talked about log files, network intrusion detection systems. You might have a firewall that's putting out alerts that something is going wrong or at IPS. Pull all of those entries in as potential source material. If you've got references to the individual port and IP address and which internal systems involved, include those as well. If you have packet captures or if you've got a threat hunt that you've done that can be used as source information, provide at least screenshots, if not logs, if possible, and raw packets are great to keep. We'll talk about packets in just a minute. And finally, if you run some commands on that system to pull out uh, open ports, running processes, who's logged in, if you pull out the actual malware itself and save that to a disk, make sure you've got some good place to save all of that information that's shared so that other people can access it too. Now, as you're walking through the individual traffic types, you're going to be presented with multiple things. The port numbers are important because they'll give you a hint, and both Chris and I will very, very carefully point out, it's a hint as to what the traffic might be. But the fact that something is traveling on port, TCP port 443, does not mean that it's HTTPS encrypted web traffic. It is just a hint for start. So this is where it's really helpful to have a packet capture of the, the actual traffic so you can go back and do an investigation to say, what is this traffic really? And is somebody just using a port to carry SSH traffic when SSH would normally be on TCP port 22? If you have a, an IP address, you may be able to turn that into a host name, but be careful. The normal method for turning an IP address into a host name is incredibly, incredibly easy to, to lie. I can put in any host name I want for any IP address that I manage. So don't use the reverse lookup as the primary source of information about what that host, about what that machine is. Instead, work with the autonomous system number. The ASN is a group of machines that is all organized by, all managed by one organization. And I can use the organization name to get a better sense of who that is, whether it's a cloud provider or a dial-up provider or a company. And I can use the country in which that's located as, again, a little bit of a hint for where it might be, but never take that as gospel. Anything that has to do with GeoIP location or geolocation is also very liable to be completely wrong. Once you know what the internal system is, you should have an answer to what is this system supposed to do. If you've got a system inventory, start with that. Go in and look up that IP address and find out what operating system is it running? What is it supposed to be doing? Is it production? Is it development? Is it test? Is it administration? We should be able to know that. If you don't have a system inventory, now you've got to go in and do it by hand, and that's going to set you back in time. So this is a good time to think about putting a system inventory in place if you don't have one already. I talk about packet capture, actually grabbing packets off the wire, especially for network level events. Now, for the thing that we're investigating, those packets have long since gone. So if I haven't been doing pack, packet capture all the time, there's no way to go back in time and grab them. However, if I've got a packet capture system going all the time and grabbing events, grabbing particular types of traffic, storing things to disk, I can later go back and look for that traffic and do analysis on that traffic, even if it was weeks or months ago. So it takes up a lot of disk space. It takes up a lot of CPU time. You've got to have a span port that you're listening on. And uh, the building a home lab presentation that we did a few, uh, about a year and a half ago for Black Hills talks about the basic steps of doing that. It's a good follow-up if you're interested in seeing how it's done. Now, once I've got those packet capture files, I can go back and say, hey, show me just this traffic. And this traffic might be 
show me all packets on TCP port 8000, or show me all traffic going to or from host 1.2.3.4, and that will limit the output to just those two characteristics. So I have the ability to filter what I get, even if the packet files themselves are massive and in some cases compressed. When you're doing packet capture, it's helpful to run that task inside a program called Screen. And I won't give a, a big description of it, but Screen's job is to run a, a task, just like I normally would have at the command line. But Screen is very nice because then I can take that task run it in the background, disconnect from it entirely, and the program keeps running, and then come back three hours later from an entirely different IP address and reconnect to it. Say, how's it doing now? This is really handy. If you look way at the end of this presentation on, I think it's the resources or links, uh, resources slide, there's a link to a blog that gives you the Cook's tour of screen, and that'll give you enough to get going. So the PCAP files that we're talking about, the nice part is that they're industry standard. There are actual multiple formats of, of PCAP files. For our purposes, we'll probably just refer to the two main ones, which are PCAP and PCAP NG. The differences are not terribly important. And unless you're using a different operating system, you're not likely to run into them in the first place. But the nice part about packet capture files or PCAP files is that I can read these files with thousands, well, hundreds probably, <laughs> hundreds of packet analysis tools. And I can go back later and reanalyze them if I've found new things to look for. Maybe we thought the incident was restricted to a single computer, but then we later found out that there were two other systems that were also infected. No problem. I can go back to those original PCAP files and say, hey, tell me what's been happening with these other two systems as well. Has it been something funky going on with them? If the system in question where the packet capture is, is happening is overloaded, I can simply move those files off to a different computer and do the analysis there. These can be massive files, as I've mentioned. I've got a blog on paring down PCAP files if that becomes necessary. You keep them as long as your policies require you. For analysis tools, obviously we've got the threat hunting packages that Active Countermeasures provides. Read is the free one, AC Hunter is the commercial one. You can also use any of the other tools that will do packet analysis, Wireshark, NGREP, Passer, DNS top, TCP dump itself, T Shark, if you like the command line version of Wireshark. All of these are available tools that let you do this analysis on whatever packet capture files you have. I can't give you a statement that you should use fill in the blank here to do your packet analysis. These tools are largely specialized in that they will accomplish one task really well. NGREP is great for looking for strings inside packets and then showing you those packets. DNS top is great at looking for DNS traffic queries and replies and basically ignores everything else. So what tool you're going to use is going to depend on what you're looking for in the packet. When you've got your list of hosts, then you need to be able to put them into one of one or more categories. Let's start off with the external hosts first. Do I know this system? Do I trust this system? Is this something where we've set the system up or it's, it's run by a business partner or some kind of organization that we partner with? Can I get more details about it from system inventory? Hopefully I can. Is this an unknown system? We just don't have any category for it. Do we have it listed on some kind of threat intel list? And if so, can we go back to that listing and say, what was the problem that put it on this list? How recent is that report? Because if it's three or four months old, then I really can't trust it much anymore. Or is it something that's been relatively recent and now I can use this as a hint for why it might be attacking? 
We talked about the ASN owner a little while earlier. That's another good hint for where the system is and potentially giving you a hint of whether it's benign or malicious or something in the middle. Or maybe we've never seen it. And so now we have to think about how do we learn more about this system. If it's an internal system, hopefully I've got a database entry that tells me something about what it's supposed to do. And if it isn't, that's your next job for the afternoon. <laughs> There are tons of places where you can go to get more information about individual hosts. You can simply go to any of these sites and plenty more where you type in the IP address and up comes the history of the IP, who owns it, what ASN it's in, what country it may be located in, maybe even down to the city and state. Again, don't trust it. <laughs> what it's done in the past. Does it have any malicious activity that we've seen before? Have people commented on this system and why it's there? The, uh, the number of things that you can pull out for free is just amazing. So this is a great place to start your search. When you get back to the internal system, now it's time to think a little bit more about what's going on on this machine. Well, if you have to do this by hand, you've got a long list of tools available to you that will help you do system analysis. LSOF on Linux or Mac OS will show you what open files there are for all of the processes on the system. And that includes things like libraries, input files, output files, the binary itself, and what network connections it may have open to the internet at this very moment. PS and Netstat will show you things about the process and the ports being held open. SS will also show you about the ports. I don't think I have a link to this in this presentation, unfortunately, but if somebody on the call would be willing just to go grab a link to the presentation I did on using Linux for people who don't normally use Linux, <laughs> The slides for that would be kind of helpful for looking at individual commands to do forensics like this. If the program that is looking suspicious is still running, you've got a couple of jobs. First is see if you can capture a copy of that program. And that might be as simple as looking down in the proc file system, finding the process ID for the running program, and then under slash proc slash PID, you'll find an object called EXE. That is the binary that's running right now. And so if I make a copy of slash proc slash 75 slash EXE to some other place like a flash drive that I put into the system in question or a virtual flash drive, if it's a virtual machine, I can copy that binary off the computer even if it was deleted immediately after it was started. So this is a very common way to get an executable even if the attacker never put it down onto physical disk and simply ran it from memory. If I've got input or output files connected to that process, I can pull those off too, the same way. So slash proc slash 75 slash FD slash one, is standard output. This is everything that that system is sending to standard output, and I may be able to pull that content off and save it to a flash drive. Save it somewhere other than the system in question, of course, because you don't want to depend on being able to access this forever once you get detected. Send them up to Virus Total if you feel that's appropriate, and see if anybody's reported this piece of malware in the past. Virus Total may already have a good deal of detail about what it does and where it connects to. That's the hard way that I just described. The easy way is Beaker. And this is an open source tool that we make available up on GitHub. And the URL is github.com slash activecm slash beaker. You can pull this down and use it for free with an open source license, and it will collect information from your Windows machines about, about all of their network connections. Over time, you know, two, three weeks, a couple of months, your Windows systems keep feeding this information off to Beaker. And then one day you've got to look up, okay, machine 1.2.3.4 in one of our data centers 
was making outbound connections to this other machine, 5.6.7.8. Can you tell me what process was running to make those connections? And Beaker can show you that information. So as long as you've set it up in advance to have your Windows machines report to Beaker, this becomes a really easy process later to go and pull that information back out. It tends to be very easy to work with AI Hunter because we've hooked, we set it up that way, but it's definitely not AC Hunter specific. You can use it in any environment for free. It will show you the process name, ports that were opened, the time that the data transfer happened, the host name, the internal host name of the uh, system that's creating the traffic, and the username under which that process was running. Very, very handy. We've got a quick article on how to set it up at uh, Beaker Instant Forensics down at the bottom. At some point as you're pulling this data together, you've got to start thinking about how you're going to categorize this. And the re easiest way to do that is to think about your policies. Now, some of you won't have actual network policies, things that say these are the allowed tasks you can do and these are the things you can't. But I think every network has a set of things that are considered appropriate and a set of things that are considered inappropriate. So this, I'm going to call them a policy, even if they're not formal documents that are submitted to an auditor three, four times a year. Just use your internal processes, your internal thoughts about how the network should be used and call those a policy and we're all set. So can we categorize something as bad? Well, if it's my malware, spyware, or ransomware, I think we've got a, the answer to our question. But you could also call something bad if it's just plain not allowed by company policy. Somebody could be doing Bitcoin mining on a computer over in a test lab. Is that hurting the rest of the network? Not really. But it's just not, it may not be allowed by your policy, or it may be totally encouraged by your policy. Figure that out first, and it makes the choice a lot easier. If you've got something that isn't specifically allowed or disallowed, but it's taking up an inordinate amount of network bandwidth, processing power, disk space, memory maybe even on a, on a system that's doing other things in production, that may be enough to say this really shouldn't be on this system. And then you can have a conversation with the system owner and say, hey, you know, you shouldn't be doing port scans of Taiwan anymore. Uh, let's go and <laughs> figure out what you're trying to do. And really the final answer of whether something is quote unquote bad is, is this focused on work? I tend to think mostly in a work mindset because most of the larger networks I deal with are ones that are run by a company. And in those environments, the, the question is, is this really something that is helping our company along? Is this something that's positive for us? If the answer is no, then we need to think carefully about whether this really should be continuing. And if it is, maybe we isolate it off onto a separate network and put bandwidth limits on the task in question and have some rules about when certain things should be done. It's, it's a... It's very hard to come up with a general statement about how to handle this, but I think you've got a sense that we can let some things continue in a controlled environment rather than simply having a knee-jerk reaction to say you can't run this anymore. Depends on your company. Do you have traffic that is disallowed by your policies, allowed by your policy, or don't care? And that really is the final question of, of whether something should be continuing at, from a network perspective. If you end up deciding that traffic is good, it is something to do with work focus, it is not hurting any system, it just wasn't something that we were expecting before. Maybe you've got a system administrator who pulls down the uh, ISO images of the operating systems that we use once a week so that you've always got the freshest copies. And somebody put up an alert that there's this huge bandwidth spike Monday morning at 1 a.m. 
Well, it turns out that that's fine. This is somebody who's planning ahead, making sure that we have local copies of certain types of things. Maybe we can simply encourage that individual to put in bandwidth limits so that as the files are being pulled down, they still come down, they take a little longer, but they don't fill up the network pipe quite as much as they used to. There's some great ways to think about how to encourage good use of, of traffic. Now, one way to handle these is, it, after you've looked at things like bandwidth limits, of course, is can we whitelist this traffic? And the only reason for describing it that way is, I've got certain types of traffic that are going to happen regularly. We've already decided they're good for our company. Let's go and mark them so that we don't have to think about them every single week. So if I can tag something as quote unquote good, put it in a whitelist and make it a relatively restricted entry so that it's only going to match this traffic that we're interested in, then I don't have to see it anymore. It still happens, but I've taken it out of my view. It means that's one less thing for me to think about next week. One entry isn't gonna make a big difference, but if I keep doing this week over week, and I keep pulling out stuff that's good and whitelisting it, then I have a better chance of seeing stuff that's bad or gray. If we decide that the traffic is bad, then we've got a couple of options available to us. The first is to block the traffic. Now, I should be putting in something like a firewall rule or an IPS rule or a router ACL, something that can identify the traffic reasonably well and block it from going in or out of the building. I have to be careful with firewall rules because it's very easy to make them too broad. And if I simply say block all traffic going to or from port 1434, well, that may not be what I really wanted. And it may block some other traffic that is legitimate. So be, try to make your rule as narrow as possible. If you can filter by ports, that's a good start. If your particular device can identify the protocol being used on that connection, such as SMTP, SSH, FTP, HTTPS, that makes it a little bit more tight. It makes it easier to find the malicious traffic and block it. If you think there is a reasonable chance you might want to follow up on this later or look into it some more, you may have an option in your firewall or router or IPS to log the traffic as well. Now, only do this if you think there's some kind of reasonable chance that you'll actually want to look into this later. If you can put a comment next to it to say why you're looking into it or what the incident was that triggered this, that's helpful too. It'll make it easier as you're doing log review later. Either approach, straight blocking or blocking and logging, will reduce the amount of traffic that's going in and out of your building. That frees up bandwidth for other tasks. It makes your packet analysis less likely to drop packets. It's a plus in general. If you're going to blacklist something or an IP address, that's great. Make sure that you've got some way to remove entries from the blacklist when they're no longer a threat to you because there's no such thing as an IP address which is always malicious and always will be malicious. They are malicious for a period of time. So make sure you've got a regular audit to go back and remove entries if you're going to take that approach. And if you don't care, <laughs> that's just fine too. Make sure you put an entry in the ticketing system to say, hey, we looked at this. This was the system in question. Here's what we found. And maybe you just never came to a conclusion of what the traffic was, but you may find in a few weeks or a few months that that same IP address pops up again, maybe in the same context, maybe in a different context. Maybe it's a totally new attack. And now you've got a little bit of history to say, hey, we found this IP address before, and look, he's showing up again. For internal users, <laughs> if what they're doing is causing problems, well, let's start with asking them not to do that. Blocking them, should be really one of your last options. 
I think my favorite quote is there's you cannot solve social problems with technological solutions. And I hope you'll think about that because the simple fact that I have the ability to modify a firewall rule and block some kind of traffic I don't like means that that person on the inside may simply just change to a different port. And now it's it's playing whack-a-mole. So try to sit down with that person, figure out what the business need is, see if you can come to a good uh, compromise on, on how they can do their work and you can keep your, your network and your system safe. Once you've identified the malicious traffic, now it's time to do the cleanup. You should know not only the initial system that was infected, but try to expand your search out. Did any other systems exhibit this behavior? And can we identify any other systems that may be having trouble? Can we find malicious processes on any of these? Just like before, you collect the binary, you do the analysis on it. Is it still running? Well, that's important to know because you want to be able to clean it off. A couple of things to consider, though, is how did it get there? What was it that put that malware on that system in the first place? And possibly more than anything else, this is a critical part of your analysis. If you can't figure out how this got on there, you're basically asking to get infected again. And not only on this system, but on others that are like it. So try to figure out what happened and when did the infection show up? Who was logged in at that time? Were there any log entries that indicate that a particular piece of malware or a buffer overflow came in? Try to find that out. I've got one more piece to think about, and I think that a couple of people on this call are going to cringe. I do too. If you know, that the attacker got up to root or administrator privilege, my statement to you is it's game over for that system. And this is where you back up any data that's on there that you can't get from some other source. You wipe the system and you reload it, making sure that you patch whatever the, the technique was that got the attacker in in the first place. So you're not repeating this process in two weeks. I would argue that if you are confident that they never re reached root or administrator privilege, that it's not as urgent that you may just consider cleaning up that particular account they got onto. But even that is, is very questionable from a security standpoint. And I'm happy to go and argue this on a with a, an adult beverage at the next conference. It may give you a little bit more time to do some analysis. It isn't urgent that you suddenly you know, just wipe the system immediately, but I would still argue that when time allows, that system should be wiped and reloaded. This is where virtual machines and templates become really handy because I may be able, if it's a virtual machine and it's something that can be spun up and spun down without loss of data, Heck, spin it down and start a new one. That's a much better way of handling. Once you've yeah. found the malware, yes, please. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. I just have a question from Ken. It's been lingering out a little while that since you circled back on it. Um, yeah. What he's asking is, is you, you were talking about you had identified a malicious process and identified an executable and made a yep. copy of that. And what his question is, is if you do copy that executable, if the process has linked libraries, will the copy include those as well? The copy, simply going and making a, a, a copy of slash proc slash 75 slash exe will only grab the executable itself. But if you use the tool called LSOF, which is list open files, and if you run LSOF space dash N, saying don't do any uh, port or name lookups, save that output to a file, you'll get a listing of the process and all libraries that that process depends on. So if you feel that there are some libraries that were introduced to the system 
that weren't there before or something got corrupted and these are corrupted libraries or you simply want to capture everything because you don't want to figure that out now we'll let the we'll let the malware team analyze it later and figure out if there's a problem you can go back and make copies of all of those files as well you can run this on any linux or mac os system right now if you simply run lsof space dash n and then pipe it into less because it's a really long output. You'll see the details for every running process on the system, including all of their libraries. And then you can individually copy those off too. That was excellent, thank you. Uh, I do notice another question, which um, I kind of know the answer, but I'm gonna throw it to you anyways. Um, oh, how, how nice to get a free <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because it's just too many variables. So, uh, but this is concerning Beaker. And it, um, the question is by uh, Akshat, and it says, can the monitoring by Beaker be stopped by an attacker remotely before the attack? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Not before the attack, but once they've gotten a, a, an entry onto the system, they could stop the running process so they could turn off the sysmon logging that is sending those entries to Beaker. Now, the beautiful part there, and this is true of many of the types of alerts that you might receive, the attacker can't really do much about log entries that were created before they got to the system or just as they were arriving on the system. The attacker can stop that logging for future network connections. And this is a little bit like killing the log daemon on a Mac or Linux system. You can have those logs just stop and there's nothing else after that. But you may have just enough, as long as you're logging to some remote computer, you may have just enough to tell how the attacker get on, got on, even if you can't tell what they did afterwards. And since our primary goal is to figure out how they got on in the first place, this is probably not a bad start. But, but you're, the person who asked is exactly right. The attacker can turn this off after they're on the system, assuming they have enough privilege. So once you've found the malware, make sure you look around and say, do any of our other systems have this same problem? You don't want to have a situation where you cleaned up one system perfectly and, and got that done. And uh, five months later, you figure out there were four others that you missed. It's a good time to take a look around. So do we know the reasons how they got in? What steps happened to give them access to this system? Did they send in an attachment that somebody double clicked on? Did somebody have access to a system they shouldn't have? Was an account left without a password and somebody came in? Did somebody forget to change the default password on a, on a router near our perimeter? We need to know what those reasons are. How did the attacker get in? And we need to address all of them. Let's assume that each of those layers were the only thing protecting us. How do we solve each of them? Let's make sure that we put in non-default passwords for our perimeter routers, please. Let's remind people not to double click on attachments and maybe we put something in their email client that strips that attachment out until it's been virus checked. The end result is how do we avoid this happening in the future? If we can't stop it from happening again, then we really have to rethink our security architecture. That has to be the final goal of making sure it doesn't happen again. We may be adjusting firewall rules or telling people not to do something. End user documentation is not a great way to handle this because people won't read it. But having something in place that will automatically stop this in the future, even if we have to pay 500 bucks a year for a piece of software to put in that filtering, that is totally worth it. When I started, I suggested that you start a running document that talks about what you found, what raw data you used, what was the timeline, how did somebody get in, where you keep track of what different types of data are being investigated and you get what's effectively a final report. Make sure you finish that up 
so that you've got your observations in place, you can support any statements that you make. And your final report should end up with something that's probably no longer than two or three paragraphs as an executive summary, way up at the top. And then the main report that has some more technical detail on what happened, what you found, how you cleaned it up, and how you avoid having this happen again. Those are four good starting points for the sections. What systems were involved is probably worth mentioning at some point. If there were some users that were involved in this, I'm, I'm a fan of not putting in names. Putting in some kind of handle for them is, is fair. Generally, people who are involved in some kind of incident or make a mistake aren't doing it intentionally. And so I, I would much rather have a blameless postmortem than then try to go and single people out for making a, a just a very reasonable mistake. And when you're done, make sure that you share it read-only with anybody else who needs to know it. You should have at least a brief conversation with your legal team, and if you've got a communications team or a public relations team, you should at least let them know that this is going on so that they have a heads up in case there are either legal or public relations issues that need to be addressed. If your policies have anything on how incidents are reported, make sure you've read that in advance so that you know when and how that information needs to be shared. Other things that you should consider. Do we have a system inventory? It's a great time to start that process now if you don't have it already. You should have a very clear separation on your networks, on your privilege levels, on where virtual machines are placed on access privileges between user systems, development systems, production systems, test systems, staging areas, so that you don't have something like a production service running on a user's desktop machine. It just doesn't work that way. Make sure you've got a good separation because that makes it easier to isolate systems so that you can't have somebody double clicking on an attachment and suddenly your main database server goes down because it's on the same computer. Try to limit access to critical systems. We, this should be kind of obvious to people in the security realm, but this is a good time to start thinking who really needs to be on this computer and why. And if it's a production box, and especially if it's something that's up on a cloud server and it's being scaled and it's being spun up and shut down on demand, do we need people getting access to it at all? Maybe the only time people need to get access to it is when it's being designed and implemented, but you may not have any ability to connect to a system with an interactive terminal once it gets up to production status. Do you have the ability to automatically patch systems or at least relaunch them with a new cloud instance that is patched? I've had my share of discussions with developers who say, well, we don't want to go and patch our systems because something might go wrong. And I do recognize that standpoint because I'm a developer too. But I also know that this is one of our best opportunities to avoid making the same mistake over and over again. So we need to think about how that patching is going to happen. Can we set up two-factor logins of some kind where it's no longer just a password for getting onto a system? Please do that if at all possible. Can I isolate things using virtual machines? This is an intriguing one. Virtual machines do not provide perfect security. However, they do give some level of isolation between running processes. And if I have a choice between a big system running five major services, my mail service, my web server, my database server, my DNS server, and my development uh, system for, for all the developers to log in, I would much rather break that up into five virtual machines so that a break-in on one does not mean you automatically get access to the other four. Do I have offline backups? And this becomes more and more important in the realm of ransomware. 
I would love to have a backup system where I can send all the files completely off this computer if I'm backing it up at all, and there are circumstances where you won't. But I'd rather have those sent off to a remote machine rather than having, let's say, a, uh, a USB drive plugged into the system and backing up directly to that, because an attacker who can encrypt the root file system can encrypt the backup drive too, just as easily. So maybe something like rsync over SSH pushing to a remote box, that particular approach may have its time coming back around again. And finally, the question of closing any listening ports that aren't truly needed. Anytime you can close a port, that's great. Chris Brenton and I were working at a company in the uh, middle of New Hampshire, and he set up the new firewall for our uh, office, and I came over to him a little bit later and said, I'm having trouble uh, connecting into that firewall with SSH. Uh, is that port open? He said, nope. Uh, I said, there are no ports open on it at all. There is no listening port on that system. And I kind of fumed for a couple of seconds, and then I realized, hey, if I can't get in, neither can anybody else. If there's no port to attack, there's no way in. And I actually slept a whole lot better one, t one night when uh, an advisory came out for SSH that would have been a problem in any other circumstance. It used to be the case that you could take a Linux system and modify it just slightly so that the system didn't wipe out the firewall and the, the interfaces on the way down, and then you type halt that system can continue to be a firewall with literally one running process, which does not have any listening ports. And I don't think you get any more hardened than that. I'm not sure if you can still do it. I haven't tried it for a while. We have some links to some other uh, blogs that we've done so that cover tools, uh, techniques, how to go and pare down peek out files so you don't, don't take up as much space using screen. And the first one in particular is worth looking through a little bit more if this topic interests you. It's going to cover some more details on this and have some more solid ideas on commands you can run and so on. So please take a look at those. Uh, thank you to Shelby for getting this ready, for Keith and Chris and Chris for helping out with the entire process and for Keith for reviewing it. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to Tina, who's joining our team. We're very happy to have her joining us. You'll find out some more about her role at uh, Active Countermeasures soon, but she's very important. And also to everybody who's listening today, thank you so much for taking the time to listen. If you've got some questions, this would be a great time to bring them up. And I'm happy to help out if there are some things that have, uh, have shown up on either Discord or GoToWebinar. So I have a question, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Please. Go ahead. Uh, my question is, when you're pairing PCAPs, what wine should you pair that with? It's definitely a rosé. Uh, you never okay. want to do a, uh, a Merlot. They just, the, the, the tastes really clash very badly with each other. And you should never, ever come to one of these webcasts asking for advice on food. I think I can just say that with a, a very straight face. <laughs> you would, Chris, of course. <laughs> yeah, and Keith, I don't know if you have like a real question. Uh, actually, I do. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It, it's about pairing with cheese. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm so glad that it's nothing. <laughs> no, I, I'm kidding. Uh, actually, this question came from Andrew, and it's any idea of the impact of blocking WebSocket traffic? Are you aware of any legitimate traffic that would break and be incapable of falling back to a long, long polling, polling process if blocked? A Andrew, I'm going to tell you honestly, I don't know the answer. Uh, I don't yeah, know WebSockets sure well enough to be able to answer that one intelligently. This is a great time for bringing that up directly on Discord if you haven't already, because it, basically anybody with a pulse is going to have a better answer than I could have. All right, is there any other questions to come up? No, I think we uh, handled most of them in the channel as they came up. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm not really seeing anything either, so 
I think uh, we're ready to wrap things up. Join us at our next webcast. Uh, we do one webcast the beginning of each month, uh, the first Wednesday of each month. You can check out when those are and what's coming up next on our events page on our website. Along with that, if you're new to threat hunting, check out our uh, six hour free threat hunt tr class that we do. And is there anything else that you guys want to say before we wrap up? Yeah, I want to say thank you to our repeat offenders. You know who you are. Yes. Uh, we got folks that show up at like every single one of these. Uh, and not only are they fun, uh, not only are they funny, but they're also incredibly helpful in the channel. Because yes. like I noticed a couple of times today that someone would ask a question and I would be halfway through typing the answer and four people have already responded. And it's always the same couple of people. So I just want to say thanks to you folks. Really appreciate it. Oh yeah, we love our community. And uh, for anyone who's joining us late, because I did just see somebody ask for it, uh, we do have a Threat Hunter community Discord server. We use that for the chat during all of our webcasts. You can find the slide decks on the server as well. And it's just a great place to interact with fellow people in the community. We have a ton of channels around threat hunting. There's a career channel, uh, LinkedIn connections. So again, uh, we'd love for you to join us there. And with that, uh, we're going to wrap things up for today, but hopefully we will see you in the next one. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank Bye. you, folks. Appreciate you coming in. <laughs>